Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 157, which reads as follows. Atananti piyang janya rakheya nang surakitang tinanganya tarangya mang patijagheya pandito which means J if one knows that the self is dear if one knows oneself to be dear to oneself if one holds oneself dear one should guard oneself well guard oneself rakeya nang surakitang guard guard oneself and guard oneself well in one or another of the yama of the watches patijagaya pandito a wise person should guard themselves or should be mindful so if one holds oneself to be dear one should be one should guard oneself at least in one of the three watches I'll explain afterwards first we have the story there's two parts to the story and I'm not really sure what the first part has to do with anything I don't I'm suspicious that it was added on later, but, or let's just say it has nothing to do with Buddhism, so we're going to skip it. Except to say that there's, there's this prince who has a questionable moral ethic. He's, he's said to have done some things in, in the past that were questionable ethics. That's all you need to know. This is about a prince, Prince Bodhi. And he built a castle, and in honor of the building of this palace, he invited the Buddha and all the monks to come and eat. It's a common thing. The idea is it's a blessing. It's also a great first memory to have. It's a great way to um, establish your intentions. I mean, this guy did seem to have and he even says himself that he's taken refuge in the Buddha. So he had some good intentions. But he also had ulterior motives even for inviting the Buddha. It turns out Bodhi, Prince Bodhi wasn't able to have kids. He was married. His wife wasn't able to conceive. And so he thought, well, well, We'll have the Buddha come and give me a blessing and uh, that'll help with the situation. And so what he did was apparently a common um, means of acquiring blessing was to have a, a spread out a white cloth and have a have a, a holy man come and step on the cloth as uh, some kind of ancient tradition, some kind of blessing. It would be a blessing if they stepped on the cloth. And so he spread these white cloths all throughout the palace so that the Buddha would ha have to step on it. And he thought, if, if he steps on it, then for sure I will, I will be blessed with a child. And so the Buddha, when he got to the, the palace, with all the monks and Ananda, his attendant, standing beside him, or behind him. He came to the door of the palace and he refused to enter. And Bodhi said, please, Venerable Sir, enter. And the Buddha stood silently. And the prince asks him again, please, Venerable Sir, the food is ready if you'll just go inside getting a little anxious and the Buddha again refuses and he asks a third time Buddha 
turns to look at Ananda. And Ananda knows, of course, what the, Buddha, what the deal is. And he says to Bodhi, get rid, of the, get rid of the carpets, get rid of the white cloth. The Buddha will not step on those cloths. The story is also in the Vinaya, and it talks about how it's, the Buddha originally, I think, forbid the monks as a result of this story from stepping on cloths because he didn't want to set this sort of precedence that the monks would be responsible, you know, and then if you didn't give birth, then the monks would be in trouble and that kind of, I mean, just to get caught up in this silly superstition. But later on, the monks, you know, people, this was a, a tradition of sorts that, you know, you would put out a white cloth for the monks, and the Buddha said, go ahead and step on the cloth. Later, you know, eventually he amended, and he said, go ahead and step on the cloth because lay people are superstitious. He said it like that. You know, and uh, it's not something we want to take an issue, take issue with. Let them have their superstition. There's not much you can do about it. The only alternative would be to really upset them. At any rate, the Buddha didn't step on this cloth, and when Bodhi rem Prince Bodhi removed all the cloths, the Buddha went into the palace, sat down to eat, and Bodhi asked him, "Look, I've been a lay per lay follower of you." follower of yours for a long time. Why wouldn't you step on the, the cloth when I put them out? It'd be a blessing to me. And the Buddha said, what were you thinking when you spread those cloths out? And he said, well, I was thinking I'd get it. I'd be able to have a child if, if you did. And the Buddha said, that's the reason I didn't step on the cloth. And he said, what's wrong? Why can't I have, why won't I be able to have a, a child? And the Buddha said, oh, not in this life, but in a past life, you were you were negligent, upamad. And he said, when, when? The Buddha told him a story of the past life. And so the story of this past life story is interesting to us, I think. Uh, so once upon a time, there was uh, a group of uh, travelers on a boat on a ship, and the ship sank, and everyone died except for a husband and a wife who ended up being shipwrecked on an island. And on this island there was nothing to eat except birds. There were many, there was a large flock of birds, and so they began by eating the eggs of these birds, cooking them, so I guess they had some way of making fire, but cooking them and eating the eggs, and eventually that wasn't enough, and so they started eating the, the young birds. And the Buddha said they did this throughout their lives. They lived out their lives on this island, and at no point did they ever think that this was a bad thing. So they, they committed terrible atrocities against these birds, killing the baby birds, ki uh, killing the unborn eggs, as a result, we're unable to the, the, they were un, unable to have a child. Not in that life. In 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 later lives, they were unable to have children. And he said, if you had, if at any time in your life, if when you were, you know, if you had started off and not, if you had stopped at any time, and he separates it into three parts. He said, if you, when you were young, if you had refrained from murdering the birds, we would have been able to conceive. If you had later on stopped, or if, when you got older, and so he splits life up into three parts. And that's why this relates to the verse. Because the verse talks about the three watches, which are actually usually refer to the three watches of the night. Which is interesting. I mean, this verse may actually not be referring to this story like the commentator says. I, I assume some people would be quite adamant that it doesn't. But uh, either way, there's benefit of seeing it in, in both ways, I think. A simple story. But the story has to do with our practice. Um, in a couple of different ways. I mean, the main issue here is that it revolves around death and rebirth, 
which I think is important. I mean, there's a lot to be said around this idea of rebirth. In Buddhism, we focus very much on the present moment. It's about what's going on right now in your body and in your mind. But at the same time, we live in a conceptual world. We live in a world of people, places, things. And we were born into a reality that is not permanent. That's the reality of being a human being. We were born and we will die. And so even even with our practice of insight meditation and being in the present moment. A general understanding of the nature of birth and death it's important not only not only to encourage us in our practice but to help us understand uh, help us understand the nature of, of reality itself how it works that there are consequences and as this story says there is power in intentional act of cruelty and or of goodness that the things we do here and now and the states of mind which we cultivate affect us they change our whole reality I mean just thinking how how could it be what is the mechanism by which a person who destroys the children of, a, of another even another species can thereby be fated to never have offspring of their own, among other things. I mean, the cruelty is certainly to lead to, certain to lead to other difficulties, both mental and physical. And the, the, the reason is the power of, the power of the mind. The power of the present to shape the future. And that all the power and all the stability, all the all of who we are here and now is, is impermanent. This body is breaking down. Death is around the corner. And after death there's more. There's a there's a new voyage, a new journey, if we haven't freed ourselves from all attachment, there's going to be a new journey to come. And so this makes us think about the things that we are doing to prepare ourselves for that moment, for, the, for that journey, for that future. It makes us think of how prepared we were in this life. What did we do? What have we come into this life with? to think of all the challenges and all the um, handicaps we've come, we've brought into this life and what may have led to them in our past lives. So this thought, the thoughts around birth and death are quite important and quite useful for insight meditation sort of as a meta-analysis or a, a sort of a side reflection that will encourage us in our practice and direct us in our practice and it will serve as a good support for our practice that we shouldn't end up like many of the figures in Buddhist literature and legend who neglected, who were negligent, who neglected the good, yes, who lived their lives in debauchery and cruelty and evil. And as a result were twisted and perverted and their minds were 
became their worst enemy. And as a result, when they were born again, they had to suffer all sorts of handicaps and difficulties. Another thing this verse, I think, that's interesting is the idea of guarding oneself in one watch. And again, I said this could refer to the three watches of the night. It, the commentary says it's actually just a uh, figure of speech referring to the three parts of life. But either way, it has the same message, that it's the understanding that we can't always be mindful. And this comes up in various places in the Buddha's teaching. When you're eating, it can be quite difficult to be mindful. Uh, when you have work to do, you know, maybe you have to build something or you have to clean something. To do something, it can be quite difficult to be mindful. And the Buddha said, the inclination is, well, I worked really hard, so now I should take a rest. And the Buddha said, well, what you should really be thinking is, I worked really hard and it was difficult to be mindful, so now that I'm done, I should, I should make twice as much effort to be mindful, to make up for it. And when you're eating as well, oh, I was eating, and that was, uh, was a lot of work. Or now I should take a rest, but no, you should think when I was eating, I couldn't be mindful. So now I should be twice as mindful, make twice as much effort. But the idea here is that we can't expect to be perfect, and we have to understand that it's not magic, or it's not a... Mindfulness is not some kind of uh, a trick. Mindfulness is a training, and you have to figure that out for yourself. You have to work at it as a training. When you're walking and sitting, when you're noting the senses and the mind states, and feelings and movements of the body. All of this is changing changing your habits, changing the way you behave, and changing the way you look at your body and the world around you. And so it's definitely something that should be done regularly, and ideally it should be done constantly. But there's certainly room for this, this, or, or it's not, we shouldn't um, disregard a sort of uh, occasional practice or partial practice. They say it's like when you, when you're carrying, when you're carrying baggage and when you have to go do some work, you put the bags down and you go and you do your work. And then when you're done, you pick the bags up again. And meditation is the same. Sometimes you can't be mindful, so you put, them, put it down. But when you're done the work, you've still got this, this weight, this burden to carry, which is the meditation. So you go back and you pick them up where you left off. There's a power in the practice. It's not something It's not something that you have to continuously do. It's something that changes you. If you practice an hour a day, two hours a day, it can be a great support. And it can make great changes in your life. You'll see it spills over into your daily life, changes the rest of your day. Even if you just do a half an hour a day, it's a great start. Just having the intention to practice, you know, where you sit down every day and do 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, can be a great benefit. The real problem is when we don't spend any time developing ourselves. I think I think we should be we should be uh, uh, encouraged by the fact that we are keen and interested in our development. Not be discouraged by sometimes how little we can practice. If you work all day, or if you 
have a family that you have to take care of. Sometimes it can seem discouraging. You just want to run away and go and live in the forest. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. We shouldn't be discouraged by having just some partial time or just some time to practice. There's a great difference between someone who practices part of their day being mindful and someone who doesn't practice at all. So anyway, simple story, simple verse. The meaning of it is guard yourself at times, spend some time cultivating good th goodness and wholesomeness. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.